Father, I humble myself before you. I'm standing before the flock that belongs to you that you have given me the opportunity to shepherd. I do not take it lightly. I always realize that the words I say from your word must be accurate. I pray, Lord, that the anointing that is on the word will penetrate each one of our lives in Jesus' name. And God's people said amen. Say it out loud with me. I believe the word of God. I believe it all. When I hear it, it brings faith. I am a believer, a receiver, and an achiever. God will use His Word today in Jesus' name. You believe it? We're talking about living life. And I believe this is about the fifth or sixth component of living life life in this series. There'll be one more, and there may be a second phase down the road, but one more next Sunday I'm going to talk about expectation, living with expectation. But today I want to talk to you about another component of the abundant life. And I want to say this to you, all that I've given you thus far in this series could be considered immediately very positive. Inspiration, motivation, domination, celebration, conversation. Well, all of that obviously seems very positive components. God wants you to live an inspired life, a motivated life, a dominating life, a celebratory life, a life filled with the right conversation. And what I'm going to give to you today, and just, just don't even walk by, the salad bar today. Just in fact, the salad bar is closed. But what I'm going to give to you today can be perceived as negative. It is this law of association is both negative and positive. But how many know when you start your vehicle, you better have a negative post on that battery? You can't start that car with just positive post. There are words in the Scripture like not. Thou shalt not. And they're put there for a reason. I've taught a whole college course on the law of association and so when we leave today fellas make sure to get your cup about 5 30 this afternoon I, I am not going to give you the entire college course and i'm going to deal more in the law of association with associations that god tells us to avoid rather than the associations he tells us to develop. And I'll do a little of both, but I believe this is one of the most important components of living the abundant life. Anyone interested, say amen. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf will not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now usually the emphasis of these scriptures is on meditating in the law of the Lord and the results of it, being like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit, your leaf not withering, whatever you're doing is prospering. But all of those positive things have a preamble in verse 1. He said, if you delight in the law of the Lord, meditate in it, you'll be like the tree, you'll prosper, you won't wither, you'll bring forth fruit. But the preamble to be able to do what's in verse 2 is in verse 1. 
And what he is saying is, you cannot delight in the law of the Lord, meditate in it, bring forth fruit, not wither, and prosper as long as you're standing in the wrong place, sitting in the wrong place, and walking with the wrong people. It's all in there. Walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. With all due respect, she's a brilliant entrepreneur, but I don't need counsel from Dr. Phil or Oprah or any of the rest of them that would dare sit on network television, hope some of you are watching, and tell your audience that there is more than one way to heaven, and Jesus lied when he said he's the only way. You dare not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Y'all still going to be here. You can observe every other law of kingdom achievement and fail to continually obey the law of association and totally destroy your destiny. You can have the right faith. You can have your praise on. You can have your worship on. But if you don't observe this law of association, you can destroy your destiny. When God wants to bless you, he sends a person or persons into your life. When Satan wants to hurt you, he sends a person or persons into your life. God works through people. Satan works through people. Now, I want to give you a Jesus law or Jesus example of the law of association because the argument is we need to treat everyone the same just as Jesus did. But that argument will not hold water. Jesus called Herod an old fox, but he called John the beloved. Doesn't sound the same to me. He said to the disciples, you have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. But he said to the Pharisees, you're a generation of snakes and headed straight to hell. I told you, Salabar's closed. Jesus did not treat everybody the same. He loved everybody. Come on. Association has nothing to do with love. It has everything to do with qualification. Jesus loved them all, but he didn't treat them all the same. You say, well, Dr. Mike, he's not a respecter of persons. You're right. He does not respect persons. He is no respecter of persons. He's a respecter of faith. He's a respecter of obedience. He's a respecter of repentance. He's a respecter of submission. He's a respecter of yieldedness. He doesn't respect who. He respects what. Every who can get into the right what and have the respect of God. You mean I can actually do things to make God like me more? Bingo! See, I'm challenging you now. Oh, my, you can't make God love you anymore. I didn't say love. Come on, you're going to have to use your mind today. I didn't say you can't do anything to make God love you more. You can do a lot of things to make God like you more. Oh, no, Brother Mike, he's a good, good father. Okay, you're a good, good father and a good, good mother. You got two kids. Both rooms are dirty. You give instruction for them to clean them up. One does, wasn't, one doesn't. You love them both. You like one. <laughs> got in my attorney clothes right there. I won that case. Amen. Come on, get a hold of this. Love is not the determining factor to association levels. Qualification is. Jesus loved everyone. And that's a good example to follow. Love everyone. Love your brothers. Love your sisters. Love the Lord. The Bible even says love your enemies. But loving someone does not mean you invite them into the inner circle of your life. Jesus didn't. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. John chapter 2, 23 and 24. Now, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Watch this. But Jesus 
did not commit himself unto them. Why? Because he knew all men. Now watch this. He did miracles for them. He's going to die on the cross for them. But is he going to commit himself to the multitudes? Never. Never. Why? He knows what's in them. Matthew 13. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why do you speak unto them in parables? He answered and said, Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but it's not given unto them. How many know we need to read the whole Bible? Oh, God just treats everybody the same, and you're supposed to treat everybody the same. No. Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables so they wouldn't understand. He said it is not given them to understand. Folks, I want to tell you something. One of the biggest mistakes you will ever make in your life is to live a life of total transparency to everybody you know. Oh, that's good preaching, Brother Mike. I'm telling you, it's one of the biggest mistakes you will ever make. Well, I just want everybody to know everything about me, and I'm just so what you see is what you get. Yeah, well, you're going to get something you didn't expect. You don't tell everybody your pain. You don't tell everybody your dreams. You don't tell everybody your vision. You don't tell everybody your need. You have an understanding that there is circles in your life. There is a multitude. There are 70 circle. There is a 12 circle. There is a 3 circle. And there is a 1 circle. I'm going to tell her what I'm never going to tell you. Don't worry, we're going to have some fun in this, but right now we're going to plow. Come on. Get this. Multitudes are motivated by miracles, and they only qualify for the ministry zone. They wanted to be where the miracles were. Well, Jesus was there, and he ministered to them. But the 70 are motivated by a desire for anointing, and they qualify for the experience zone. The 12 apostles are motivated by a desire for revelation, and they qualify for the discipleship or the learner zone. Are you grabbing this? this I'm not talking about the church. I'm talking about your life. Everybody that's in your multitude is not supposed to be in your 70. Everybody that's in your 70 circle doesn't qualify to be in your 12 circle. Three of the 12 are motivated by a desire for relationship and access, and they qualify for the impartation zone. Who were they? Peter, James, John. He only took those three to the Mount of Transfiguration, and they saw Elijah and Moses. In fact, when he's coming back down the hill, he said, Guys, for goodness sake, don't tell the other nine what you saw. Why? Because they're spooky. They are. When they saw Jesus walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost. And he said, if you tell them, they can't handle this. And then there was one of the three that was motivated by desire for intimacy. And he qualified for the mantle zone. Who was that? John the Beloved. He's the only one that goes to the trial. He's the only, come on, you got a lot of people that go when you can get bread and fish sandwiches. But when they come and arrest you and haul yourself to the trial, there's only one that follows. There was only one that was at the cross. But he gave him the mantle of caring for his mother. He gave him further revelation in the book of Revelation. So get a hold of this. Folks, I'm, I'm teaching you some stuff right now that in my mentoring training, I train my high-level protégés. What I'm teaching you today, if you will implement into your life, you don't have to be mean-spirited, you don't need to be negative, you don't need to be cynical or critical or unloving. You don't even have to tell them. Don't go and say, whoop, you're in the multitude level. I'm talking to the 12. You don't have to tell them anything. Just know they're circles and protect your circles. Well, Brother Mike, if I let them close to me, it'll change them. No, it'll change you. The scriptural law of association commands separation from many relationships. 
All right, how many can take some pretty strong scriptures right now? One right after the other. Proverbs 13, 20. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Is that in your Bible? Ephesians 5, 11, and 12. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. 1 Corinthians 5, 11. I have written unto you not to keep company if any man, watch this, that is called a brother or a sister, be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer. A railer means one that is a backbiter and a gossip or a drunkard or an extortioner. Watch this. With such a one, don't eat. This is in the Bible. But Brother Mike, it's just, and if you're, <laughs> if your primary motivational gift is mercy, like my wife's, these verses are tough. Now notice something. He didn't say don't, don't, don't eat with covetous, railers, extortioners. He said with brothers or sisters that are living in willing, obvious sin. Folks, we're going to have revival. We've got to go back to a re-Bible. And, I, and, and as far as I know, none of that's happening in our church, but an ounce of prophetic provision is worth a pound of pastoral cure. You just don't. I had someone come to me three or four months ago. Doesn't even come to this church. They wanted to start in railing about uh, somebody in this church that I happen to know very well. And I just told them, I said, listen, I said, you're not even part of our FWC family. I'm not really even sure you're part of the family of God the way you talk. Now, you don't have to be like me, but it's natural for me to be like me. I mean, I, I listen. I'm in covenant with you. I know that all none of us are perfect, except my wife. I know. <laughs> I know that none of us are perfect, me included, you included. But nobody going to come up in here to your pastor and start talking to me about somebody in this church when they don't even have the guts to go to any church anyway. This cat that was talking to me, went on to say, I can't find a church spiritual enough for me. You've got the spirit of an Adonijah. You're a male Jezebel. You are a railer, and I'm not going to have anything to do with what you're saying. Now, you don't have to have this mean spirit that I've developed well. And it may not fit you, but it works with me. I, I am not going to have it. I, am, I have people come to me, other preachers, wanting to talk about other preachers. Well, no, hold it. Hold it. Who are you to judge another man's servant before his own master he stands and falls? God is able to make him stand. Well, I just think you just think you don't know. You haven't walked where he's walking. You haven't gone through what he's gone through. Yeah, but I think his doctrine is wrong. Well, if his doctrine is wrong, you can preach truth without slashing his throat and pray for him and let God deal with him. Instead, of, I'm preaching truth here. Well, I got on that rabbit trail, so we'll get back on the highway. 2 Thessalonians 3.14, If any man obey not our word by this epistle, by the word of God, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. This is in the Bible. Romans 16.17, I beseech you, brethren, mark them. The Greek says, spy them out which cause division, disunity, and offenses, an unusual word. It means a trap stick or a bent sapling, something that you step in and get caught. Contrary to the doctrine of the Word of God, which you've learned, and avoid. And the word avoid is so strong in the Greek, it says go out of your way to shun them. 
Now, don't worry, folks. We're going to get to the peaches and cream in a little bit. But right now, this is castor oil that will keep you healthy. Well, I just, I just look for the good in people all the time. And yeah. Well, I got a pair of boots from a diamondback rattlesnake. And they are good-looking boots. And that diamondback is beautiful. But I'm not going to invite him in till he experiences the death of the flesh. He, he, he belongs on my feet, but not in my ear. Oh, uh, oh. Oh. 2 Timothy 4.14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. And then watch what he says. Of whom be thou ware also, for he has greatly withstood our works. Did he love Alexander the coppersmith? Yes. But did he beware of him? You better believe it. Don't worry, folks. Be back next week. Expectation. We're going to talk about this this week. 1 Timothy 1.20, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, if you're sitting out there thinking I'm worried about somebody saying something in the church, I don't know a stinking thing that's being said in the church unless the Holy Spirit reveals it to me. I don't go around interviewing. But I do talk to the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. Whatever he wants me to know, I'll know. So that's not the motivation of this message. It's not about me, and it's not about the health of this church. It's about you. I'm trying to tell you there are Hymeneuses and Alexanders and Delilahs and Adonijahs and Jezebels and Judases that will try to infiltrate into the inner circle of your life and if you don't have discernment and perception and put up a circle barrier, they will so infiltrate your mind that you can depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Anybody still love me? Because I love you. Ungodly counsel cannot lead you toward a godly goal. When you stand in the way of sinners, it won't be long until you're walking in their way. You cannot sit in fellowship with scornful, critical, bitter people and avoid being infected with their contagion. The destiny of an entire generation of Israel could not be destroyed by slavery. Think about this. I'm going to slow down on this. The destiny of a generation of Israel could not be destroyed by 400 and 90 years of slavery. Pharaoh could not destroy their destiny. Plagues did not affect their destiny. The desert could not conceal their destiny. Even sin in the camp only delayed their destiny. Watch. But failure to observe and obey the law of association destroyed the destiny of an entire generation of God's people. You see why the Lord wanted me to talk about this and the components of living life. God wants to bless you, Boaz comes. God wants to curse, uh, Satan wants to curse you, Jezebel comes. You must know the law of recognition. You must have discernment. Understand. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you don't pray for them. It doesn't mean you hold bitterness in their heart. It just means you know them. You know them. You ever have people around you and say, I don't know why, but I'm just not comfortable around some people. That's because those people know them. <laughs> oh, I, oh. Uh, there's a lot of rabbit trails I could go down. I don't have time. Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Eight kinds of people you must deal with on the road to your destiny. How many here want to fulfill God's plan for your life? God has a destiny for your life. 
Say, well, that's to get to heaven. Well, go now. I mean, if that was God's plan, he'd, he'd bump us off when we got born again. No. God's plan for us is this side of heaven. And there's eight kinds of people in this story in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. And I want to come back and really teach it verse by verse some other time because there's so much more in it. But I'm going to give you, here's what I'm going to talk to you about in the next few minutes. Non-attainers, no-brainers, drainers, strainers, restrainers, attainers, trainers, and sustainers. Repeat that. Now, come on. I'm going to help you with this. Let me, let me set the story for you. They've come out of Egypt. They've come through the wilderness. They're at a place called Kadesh Barnea. God says, I've given you the whole land from the river of Egypt all the way to the river Euphrates. He says, go across the Jordan wherever your foot walks. I have already given it to you. Go in and possess the land. And so they say, well, we need to reconnoiter the land. We need to send some recon in. So they send in the spies from the land or, or into the land. And you know the story. They walked around for 40 days, and they had a recon mission for 40 days. And they found grapes. They came back took two of them to carry one cluster of grapes. Now, that's real organic, non-growth hormone grapes. Grapes probably as big as softballs, bigger than oranges. My mentor, my youth, C.M. Ward, in his inevitable way, said, bananas as long as fence rails and grapes as big as grapefruits. But that was Brother Ward's translation. But it was a good land, in other words. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was a land of plenty. And it, God said it was their land. And they came back, and ten of the spies delivered this report. It's a gorgeous land. It's a beautiful land. But we can't have it. There's no way we can have it. There's giants in the land. It's amazing how quick we forget what God has done. You just saw the destruction of the Egyptian empire, the greatest empire in the history of the world to date. God did it. You didn't. He opened the Red Sea, brought you out. His presence has been a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day, and you're worried about an Amalekite or two. Come on. Now, before you get too critical, we can get the same way. That's why God told us these Old Testament stories. The Bible said they're given to us as examples of what to do and what not to do. So let me give you these eight people. Number one, non-attainers. Non-attainers. Numbers 13, 31, the men that went up with him said, watch this, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. When God gives you a dream or a vision or an assignment, there's going to be a great number of people in your life that will tell you it can't be done. It can't be done. Now, wait a minute. Let's ask some questions. Did God give you that burden? Did God put that vision and that dream in your heart? Did God tell you to write that book? Did God tell you to start that company? Did God tell you to go to that college and get that degree? Did God tell you, well, yeah, I know, I know that's God's plan for my life. Then why are you listening to all the you can't do it stuff? You think God is so bipolar he would give you an assignment that's impossible for you to do? Never. But you're always going to have non-attainers. Can't do, can't do, can't be done. And that can't be done. Come on, you ready for the next thing they say? Here's the next thing they say. It's never been done this way before. We have never gone into Canaan before. We've been slaves for 490 years. It can't be done. We can do non-attainers. Listen, friend, I love non-attainers, but I love them long distance. I'm not going to have them in the middle of my dreams. I'm not going to have them in the middle of our dreams. I'm telling you, I don't care how much people may laugh at me, and I haven't heard any people laughing at me, but I'm sure demons would like to laugh 
But boys, you're not going to laugh long because what God has said, he will do. And I want to tell you something. There will be a day of Jesus tarries that there will be as much sent to world missions from FWC as the entire operating budget for a year, every year, every year. Say, Brown, you're out of your mind. I'm trying to get you out of yours. I serve a big God. I serve a God of the impossible. I serve a God who can do all things. Nothing is impossible to them that believe. And God wouldn't have put that in the heart of this pastor if he didn't want to do it. So guess what? I'm not going to have people in my inner circle saying, uh, calm down, pastor. I don't want you to be disappointed. We can't do it. There's giants in the land. <laughs> and I'm going, to say, I'm going to say, hey, how about those chiefs? Do you think they'll win this year? Praise the Lord. I'm going to switch that conversation. I'm not even going to respond to that stuff. Why? I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And if God told me to go into the land, he'll strengthen me to go in and take the land. And the naysayers, well, your mom, your mom had this kind of cancer, so you're going to, too. Well, your dad had this kind of a mental problem, so you're going to, too. Ah, ah, ah. No, 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 no. I understand medical implications. I understand physical DNA. But can I just tell you that when I got born again, I also got a new DNA, and that's the divine nature of the Almighty, and I'm not going to have that. Well, you can't do it. You're too young. You're too old. You're too middle-aged. You're too uneducated. You're too educated. You've got too big a mouth. I'm not listening. I'm not listening to that. Folks, don't, don't let people, we're seeing it in America today on the media. We're never going to come out of it again. This is the new normal. We've just got gas is going to go to $10 a gallon, and it'll be that way forever. We don't know what to do. Well, drill the oil, open the pipeline, shut your mouth. Pump it in. Refine the oil. Oh, oh, oh. I get so tired. I thought Goofy was only a Disney character. I'm sorry. I just lost my pastoral dignity there. But Non-attainers. They'll always say, Wilbur Norville. Wilbur Norville, right? If God wanted men to fly, he'd have given them wings. Thomas Edison, you have tried to invent the incandescent light bulb over 200 times and failed. A reporter said to him, I love his answer. He said, I have not failed one time. I have succeeded over 200 times in discovering what will not work. That's a mind talking. And you say, well, Brother Mike, this isn't spiritual. Listen, I'm as Holy Ghost filled as anybody in here. I'm full gospel from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. But a lot of us want the Holy Spirit to do everything. And if he was going to do it, he would have not filled you. He has filled you. He has assigned you. He has equipped you. And he has put you into the seven mountains of culture. And we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And we can make a difference. Next, now don't get offended at this, but you're going to run into people this way. And I'm not talking about their IQ. I'm talking about silly things people say. These guys that came back were no-brainers. They weren't using their mind. They weren't using, they weren't, how do you know if somebody's not using their brain? By what they say. Now, now notice what they said, Numbers 14.2. They brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, watch this, the land through which we have gone to search, it is a land, number one, that eats up the inhabitants thereof. This land just eats up the people that are there. 
And notice the next thing they said, number two. And all the people we saw there are men of great stature. Say, Brother Mike, I find my own. No. How shall they believe it except there be a preacher? You do find your own revelation, but there's revelation that comes from a preacher. Read Romans chapter 10. Well, I don't like that. Well, that spirit of rebellion needs to get out of you. Notice what they said. It is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. So if the land destroys all the inhabitants thereof, how are the inhabitants thereof giants? Now, that's an oxymoron. You, you can't be eaten up and destroyed and be. Can't be both. You understand when you fail to believe God, you start thinking foolishly. Folks, I love my country. I'd die for it this afternoon. I mean that with all my heart. I'd die for it so young men and young women in the next generation could preach the gospel and do great things. If need be, I'd lay down my life for my country. And I think those of you who've been around me not much know that. But I've never heard such foolishness in all of my life. Nonsensical. Not hardly pre-K level IQ. And, and both parties got enough of it. And it's not because the men and the women don't have intelligence. It's because when you no longer like to retain God in your knowledge, God gives a nation or people over to a reprobate mind, and they worship and serve the creature more than the creator, and it is a debilitating vortex that keeps getting worse and worse. And we're just supposed to kind of stand by and say, hmm, maybe that's true. There are 70 genders. Come on, guys. Brother Mike, I wish you wouldn't talk about things like this. Well, who's going to? If men of God don't, who's going to? If, if the Word of God's not going to be held up, who's going to hold up the Word of God? I love people, but I'd rather offend people than offend God. I don't want to offend God. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to help you. Stupidity will grow faster than brilliance. Don't let it close all the time to you. <laughs> Number next. Drainers. You're going to go into your promised land? There's going to be people who try to drain you. Numbers 14, 1 and 2. All the congregation. Oh, listen to this. You got to read it right. All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And they all murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Here you go. Would God we had died in the land of Egypt. Would God we died in the wilderness. Now watch this. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their face before the whole assembly. There are people that will drain you to such a place that you'll fall on your face. <laughs> it's like they hook a hose up to you. And they drain all the joy, all the faith, all the expectation. Come on, don't act like you've never met them. How are you today? Well, well, with under the circumstances and with all of my problems, I guess I'm going to make it. I'm hanging in there like a hair in a biscuit. I'm going to make it. Ah. Uh, Would to God we could be back in the 50s. Would to God, would to God we died in the desert. Would to God we died in Egypt. 
And you go on over to chapter 14, verse 28, and in the NIV, it makes it plain. God said to them, I will do unto you exactly what I heard you say. Read it in the NIV. They said, God, would we died in the wilderness, he said. We can arrange that. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. Look, folks, when you're down, if you can pray in the Spirit, just pray in the Spirit. But don't pray Mickey Mouse prayers. God, just kill me. <laughs> a friend of mine did that years ago. He said, I just got in a great man of God. And God he said, God, just kill me. I've done all I can do. Just kill me. And he said, Mike, darkness started to come from the right and the left. And he said, by the time it got to me, I was going, not really. I didn't mean that. I'm just saying uh, that was an allegory. Folks, come on, are you receiving this? Love drainers, but don't let them drain you. Next, strainers. Say that one with me. Strainers. Say it again. Strainers. Numbers 14, 11, and 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, <laughs> Wow. How long will these people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I've shown among them? I'll smite them with pestilence, disinherit them, and make of you a greater nation and mightier than they. Now watch, watch. I got, I got to finish this up. But come on, watch. We're going to end with the good folk. This is God talking. This is God, watch, who all through the Old Testament says, the mercy of the Lord endures forever. This is that God. And you know what this God just said? He said, I've had enough of this. Well, I thought the mercy of the Lord endures forever. It does, just not for everybody. Getting quiet now. Oh. Oh, no, the mercy of the Lord endures forever for everybody. Ask Ananias and Sapphira about it. Ask Uzzah about it. Ask this entire generation from 20 up. You know what? I mean, listen, friend. If a God so full of mercy whose name is love, can be so strained by some people that he wants to kill them. Read it. He said to Moses, Moses, I'll kill them all. We'll start with you. Read it. Now, this is the... So I'm, 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 they, He didn't do it. it well, he did, but it took 40 years. He was going to kill them that day. But Moses stepped in. Thank God for Moses is in your life. Watch this. If there are people that can strain God to such a place that he wants to destroy them, what chance do you and I have there on the inner circle of our lives feeding us all that negativity constantly? I mean, you'll lose your cool. You'll lose your temper. You'll get bitter. You'll get caustic. You'll get toxic. Love them but love them long distance. Don't let them strain you. Next, put the next one up. Restrainers. Not only would they not go into their destiny, they don't want you to go in. Come on, am I preaching right today? Have you ever noticed people that don't want to go into their victory, but they want you to stay with them? Uh, we've decided to die in the desert. Come and join us. No, thanks. No, man, if I can have grapes the biggest, as big as grapefruits, I don't want to live in the desert. There's people in your life that just want, they want to pull you back. They're not launchers. They're limiters. Come on, they're limiters. They try to limit you. See, I don't want to limit Hector and his generation. I want to launch Hector and his generation. I don't want to limit my son and my daughter-in-law. I want them to do more than I've done. I don't want to limit people. 
FWC isn't a place where we come to limit people. It's a place where we launch people into their destiny. Next. Attainers. Ha, 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 ha. Now we're We've already got away from the non-attainers, no-brainers, drainers, restrainers, and strainers. But there are three in this story. Number one, attainers. Say it with me. Attainers. Numbers 1330. Caleb stilled the people before Moses. Now this is the way attainers talk. And said, let's go up right now and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. Come on now, y'all have been waiting for me to get to this part. All those five negative things going on, but in the middle of all that negative stuff going on, there'll be somebody up in your life that'll look at you and say, yeah, you can do it. God gave it to you. It belongs to you. Though the giants may be, oh, I thought of an old song. That's rare, isn't it? Hallelujah. I thought of an old song. We are well able to go up and take the country, you remember, brother, to possess the land from Jordan to the sea. Though the giants may be there, our way to hinder. God will surely give us victory. <laughs> well, I wish somebody shout a little bit. I don't care. We are. FWC, we are well able to go up and take the country, to possess the land from Jordan to the sea. Though the giants may be there our way to hinder, God will surely give the victory. Come on, folks, get around somebody in your life that when you're down won't let you stay there. Get somebody in your life that won't whine with you when you want to whine. It's somebody in your life that'll look at you and say, now stop it. You're bigger than that. You're going to make it. I'll weep with you a little bit, but then we're going to dry those tears, and we're going to profess the word of the living God, and we're not going to sorrow as those who have no hope, and we're not going to stay back there. We're going to move up there. Attainers, we can do it. My daddy was a CB in World War II. On the patch on his sleeve, it had the, his slogan, the slogan of the CBs, can do. Can do. We can do, folks. We can do. We can do. We can have revival in the month of July. We can have a month of revival and just continue in it. We can. We can. Somebody say it with me. We can. We can. You're not going to hear me get up ever in this pulpit and tell you what you can't do, what you can't accomplish, what you can't ch achieve. If God be for you, who can be against you? I'm really trying to stay settled here, but I'm not trying too hard. Hallelujah. Get some attainers in your life. But, Brother Mike, I've had a setback, baby. It's nothing but a setup. I tell you, God can take what the devil meant for evil and turn that thing around 360 or 180, rather, and set you back on the course. Don't you worry about where you failed and you messed up and somebody else did something to you. It doesn't change it. <laughs> Caleb said, and he still felt the same way. I love this. I'm, I'm going to quit just as soon as I finish. I love Caleb. He comes back into the land 40 years later. All of those 20 and up have died. You know what God said? He said, you searched the land for 40 days and doubted me. I'm going to give you 40 years of death for every day of doubt. They died for 40 years. And Caleb and Joshua are the only ones left. They come back in. <laughs> and Caleb hadn't changed one bit. Now, come on. Think about this. Now, think about this. He has walked with a whole generation for 40 years of non-attainers, drainers, strainers, no-brainers, griping constantly. Hadn't changed him one bit. He comes back, and here's the second truth. God hadn't changed his will one bit. He still said, you go in there. And they went in and took the land. Here's what I love about Caleb. Caleb is well over 80 years old. He's pushing up toward 100. And he gets to the land, he walks up to his good buddy Josh, Joshua. He says, Josh, Moses, God gave through Moses 
a certain mountain that belongs to me. It's my possession. And there are giant Amalekites up in there. And he said, I want my mountain. And he said, I'm going to be gone a couple of Sundays. A couple of Sabbaths, rather. He said, it might not even take that long. But I'm going to go up there and run those giants out of my land. That's my land. God gave that to me. I've had to wait 40 years, and I've, I've got plans for condos on that up there. Whatever he had plans. And I can almost hear some of the other people. Man, Caleb, you know, 40 years ago, that, 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 yeah, but, you know, you're no spring chicken now, buddy. These, these boys are young, and they're giants. And I love what Caleb said. He said, I'm as I'm strong, I'm as strong today as I was 40 years ago, and that's my mountain, and God gave it to me. And if God says it's mine, I'm going to possess it. And I, I, this is Mike Brown 518. I, I can't prove it in Scripture. But I think he was gone maybe a little longer than what they thought. And some of them was probably having a memorial service for old brother Caleb. He's been killed by the giants. And all of a sudden, right in the middle of that service, came about 55 giants running as hard as they could run with this old man with a spear saying, And stay out! Oh, folks, God can do it no matter what your age is. Next, I've got to give you two more. Oh, are you glad you came today? Trainers. What kind of people do you need in your life? Attainers, trainers. Numbers 14, 8 and 9. Caleb and Joshua begin to train the people. And they said this, if the Lord delight in us, he will bring us into the land. He'll give it to us. A land that flows with milk and money. I mean, honey. I know what it says. But after they got in, it flowed with milk and money. Milk and honey. Only rebel ye not against the Lord. Neither fear the people. They are bred for us. Their defense is departed. The Lord is with us. Don't be afraid. What are those kind of people? Trainers. Why don't I just come in and give you three points real simple every Sunday? Because I'm a trainer. I don't want to just inspire you. I want to train you. Why are we going to have a mentor mentoring institute for those of you who want to be involved? Because I'm a trainer. I want to train you. It's one thing to teach. It's another thing to train. I'm trying to do both today. I'm a trainer. I want to train you how to do it. I don't care if you're Mike Tyson or Muhammad Ali. And you can float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. If you don't have a trainer to tell you how to bob that head and move that body, you're going to meet a Joe Frazier that knocks you into the Wizard of Ozland. You have to have a trainer. And God has raised up apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to be trainers. And all five-fold ministry does it different. But we're trainers. Why do I give you an overcomer's manual? What? It's a lot of work. Ask my staff. No, don't ask my staff. It's a lot of work. Why do I do that? Why do we just mail more overcomer manuals out to other preachers across the nation free of charge? Why? Why would I give out everything I've taught, everything I've preached? Why do I do that? I'm a trainer. I'm a trainer. Brother Mike, you could put those in books and sell them. I have a Jehovah Jireh. I said I have a Jehovah Jireh. I'll have some books, and I got four and two more working. And we sell books, but I have a Jehovah Jireh. Trainer, God, get somebody in your life. Look, folks, that's why. Don't just take those overcomers' manuals home and don't read them. Read them. Highlight them. See what you've learned. Implement it. Oh, do you hear the heart of your pastor today? I'm, I'm pleading with you. In these days in which we live, Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You need attainers, you need trainers. I need Doug at the piano. Last, you need sustainers. Say that word with me, sustainers. What's a sustainer? A sustainer is somebody that when you're down, or you're surrounded by people that are against you, or you've lost your faith, will go to bats for you. 
there's sometimes that you can't go to bats for yourself and you need somebody to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Look, notice, Caleb and Joshua were trainers, but Moses was a sustainer. Notice what he said. God said, Moses, I'm going to kill him. I'll start over with you. And I'm not reading all the negotiation he did with God. But watch this. He prayed for those people. Now, here's the amazing thing. Come on, don't, don't, come on, stay with me. Watch this. A few verses earlier than this verse, the Bible said they turned to stone Moses and Caleb and Joshua. Let me tell you something. Just because you try to help people does not mean that they won't retaliate against you. They're ready to kill Moses. And God gets upset about it. And God says to Moses, they won't kill you. I'll kill them. We'll start over with you. Move just a little bit over. Joshua, a little bit more. Caleb, a little bit more. I'm going to throw my fastball. And Moses has such a heart that he begins to pray this. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people all the way from Egypt until now. Boy, that's an understatement. He had to forgive them and forgive them and forgive them. God said ten times they had abused him, even until now. And the Lord said, okay, Moses, I'll pardon them because of your words. I don't know. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful at times in my life when my faith wasn't what it should be, that I had a good, good father. I had a good, good mother, and they were sustainers for me. When my heart was broken in a billion pieces, they'd lift me up, hold me up, wouldn't let me give away my faith. I thank God for men in my life, great men of God. You know every one of their names. I have their phone numbers in my phone. Say, Brother Mike, won't you tell me who they all are? Because their friendship to me is not to be used to drop names and promote self. It's too great a relationship. I remember on one, one occasion at the worst time in my life, and... A man of God asked me to come to a major conference and minister, and I did. Almost didn't go. Listen, friend, when you're in trouble, don't back up. Move forward. I almost didn't go. almost canceled it. But I went. Can you, can you stick with me a minute or two, can you? I went. And uh, it was glorious, and there were 7,000 people in the auditorium and worldwide satellite, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I preached on that platform, etc. cetera. And, and, and folks, if you ever think it's you, you'll find out it never was you in the first place. When you're at the bottom of your life and you stand up and the anointing of God on your calling comes on you and you see results like you've never seen. And all of a sudden you realize like you never knew before, it never was you in the first place. And uh, I wasn't preaching this night. Boy, I don't know why. Karen, I'm telling this story. I wasn't preaching that night. I was sitting over the side with many other men of God, and women of God. And the man of God was preaching in that particular conference. And I had told the Lord at the top floor of the beautiful hotel in a beautiful suite. I said, Father, I'd, I'd, you know I've never asked this before. I said, Lord, you know I just stand on your written word. I operate in the prophetic word. I believe in prophetic words, but I always stand on the written word. And I said, but Lord, the man the people see on the platform is the man cloaked in the anointing to do his job. And they see the glory, but they don't know the story that I'm walking through right now. And I said, Father, I'm so low. I'm so low. I said, Lord, if you would, Father, tonight, 
while brother so-and-so, I'm not even going to call his name, while he's preaching, I said, if you're going to use me, maybe I shouldn't have asked it, but God answered, so I guess it's okay. I said, if you're really going to bring me out of this hurt that I'm in, this pain that I'm in. See, people think preachers are never supposed to go through that. But I wouldn't follow a preacher that hadn't had a battle somewhere in their life. I wasn't mad at God. I wasn't going to go out and sin, live wrong, any of that. Just all hell had come against my life. And I'm sitting over here, and I said, Lord, tonight, I need you to have that man of God in front of 7,000 people and the satellite on. It's somewhere in the middle of his message to turn and walk to me and speak to me directly. So, And this man of God never does that. I've never seen him do it before or after. And I went and sat down. He read his text about when Sennacherib was invading the children of Israel. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Fear not the words which you have heard him speak, for he blasphemes me. There shall not come an arrow into your city. And he was preaching that. And in the middle of his preaching, he stopped. He turned. He walked over to me. He reached down and took my hand. And he said, Mike, don't fear the words. The devil is speaking into your mind. There will not be one arrow of destruction coming to your life or into your ministry. Thus saith the Lord. Turn around. Went back and preached the rest of his sermon. I'm telling you, God will do things for you when you need God to do things for you. I've never asked Him to do that for me again, but I needed it that night. I needed it that night. You want sustainers in your life. And by God's grace, Karen and I are going to be sustainers for you. Sister Carol's going to be a sustainer for you. Other intercessors in here are going to be sustainers for you. Even if you mess up, even if you, you miss it some way, even when you're down, even when you're not shouting hallelujah, we're going to sustain you before God. We're going to cry out to God for you and say, there's more in them than they know. God, don't, don't remove their destiny. God, don't remove their destiny. So, what the Lord gave me for you today that you uh, watch your associations watch your associations oh, I feel the Holy Spirit so much I'm trembling before him right folks don't sell your destiny for a bowl of beans because you got close to an Esau. Don't let bitterness infect you because you got close to somebody and let them inject you with all of that. Don't do it. Love them, but don't let them defile you. You say, Brother Mike, what if it's somebody in my family? Very difficult, I know that. Just pray and ask God to give you grace. And the Bible says He gives more grace. He gives grace. He gives favor. He's able to help you in that. Some of you, as I close today, you'd say, but Brother Mike, I've, I've let people mess me up before in my life. Yeah, but let, we're not living there. You can't go forward looking backward. You can't go forward looking backward. But Brother Mike, I, 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 I had the wrong business association. Or I had a wrong relationship. I'm sorry. And you say, I, I look back now and I see where I missed it. I'm sorry. But you can go forward now. Give it to God. Learn your lessons. Forget the things which are behind. And move on forward. 
because there remains much more land. There remains much more land yet to be possessed for the glory of God. Come on, raise both hands up to heaven and give Him praise. Come on. Come on, use your voice. Just give Him praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for training us today. Thank you, Lord, for training us today. Thank you, Lord, for training us today, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for training us today. Thank you, Lord. I want to pray over you before we go, and we'll open these altars for anyone that has a need or needs to come to Jesus for any reason. But I want to give you this warning. One wrong person at a crucial time in your life can delay your destiny for decades. And this message has not been given to you. Give me a little more mic. My, my voice is about. It's not been given to you so you'd be judgmental of people. It's not been given to you so you'd be prejudiced against people. It's not been given to you to, so you can get hate in your heart, mean-spirited. It's, it's not what it is. It's given to you because you can't love them right until you love yourself right. You can't love yourself right until you love God right. It's what Jesus taught. And the Holy Spirit deals with me right now before we leave this building. And some of you are still weeping over mistakes you've made in relationships in your yesterdays. And it's paralyzed you in the moment. About the time you begin, boy, I'm speaking under an anointing right now, if you'll hear me. Yes. Yes. About the time God gets ready to move you in to your Canaan of influence for Him, you remember how that relationship stopped you. You remember how that messed you up. And you get paralyzed right there. And the devil knows it, and he pulls it on you every time. I don't have to speak King James to be speaking a word of knowledge right now. He pulls it on you every time. When you just about go into what God has for you. Remember that relationship. You should have never gotten business with him. You should have never got with her. You should have never got with it. And you stop right there. You stop right there. You won't move. Are you saved? Yes. You going to heaven? Yes. Will you have regrets when you get there? Many. Many. At the judgment seat of Christ, he has to wipe away tears. Why? Because when you see where you could have gone, what you could have done, people you could have known, influence you could have had, but you let people, associations, paralyze you. I've made up my mind that's not going to happen anymore in my life ever again. I'm available to Jesus. I said I'm available to Jesus. I don't have to get any glory, and I don't want any of it. I'm willing to do the little thing and the big thing and all the things in between. But I want to spend the rest of my days never being paralyzed again by somebody that's a non-attainer, drainer, strainer, restrainer. Never. Never. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. How many of you just say this? I know what time it is. I thought about starting at 10 so we could get out of the magic hour at noon. And maybe we can do that if it'll help. But I'm going to, I'm not one of these guys. I'm a trainer. I'm a trainer. I, I don't criticize the others, but I'm a trainer. 
and the Holy Spirit's dealing with me right now. And we don't even have to bow our heads. We're family up in here. How many of you would say, Brother Mike, a wrong relationship, a wrong association, a wrong business partner, whatever. It may have been 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 days ago. You say, Brother Mike, every time I get ready to go where God wants me to go in influence, I get paralyzed instantly thinking about it. And I want to be set free of that today. And I believe he'll do it. Slip your hand up if you're like that all over the building. Just slip your hand up. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. Come on, step out. If you raised your hand, step out and come and stand up here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Come on. If you need to slip out while we're praying, we understand. That's all right. Just slip out quietly. We love you. We're honored you came. But I just want to touch people's lives. I want to touch people's lives. I said I want to touch people's lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That's okay. We'll make room down here. Come on. We got more room over here. Praise God. Come on. I want to pray for you today. Just look up here at me and we'll pray in just a moment. I can't imagine what it's like to live paralyzed physically. I'm a very active man. I like to move. I like to do things. And I've seen and I have great respect really for some people that have been able to manage. What was the beautiful little brown uh, uh, blonde lady? Oh, I can't remember, but she said born again. There's really been a change in me, but she was in a wheelchair. I, I can't remember, but anyway. And, and I have great respect for her. Well, brother, my God can heal her. I know that he can do it tomorrow, but she's doing real good right now. She has more victory than a lot of people that are walking around. I can't imagine what it would be like to be paralyzed physically. But it can be worse to be paralyzed emotionally, spiritually, mentally. You just can't move. There's a passion in your heart to see it and do it. But when you start, you lock up. And it's all because, well, I got with the wrong person or I made a wrong choice. Listen, friend, God doesn't want you to live in that way. Not one more day. I said not one more day. I said not one more day. But Brother Mike, it, it, maybe it wasn't even their fault. Maybe it was your fault. Well, so? So? Repentance changes that, you know. If we confess, he's faithful and just. Well, but the other one hurt me so bad in his prayer. You mean, listen to me. You mean to tell me you're going to let that person? Brother Mike, I was abused when I was young. He's still abusing you. You're, my God, I feel the anointing right. You're still in the event. And people will tell you in the secular world, you'll never get over it. Baloney. God will bring you out of that. And that moment of time will not define you the rest of your life. Will not define you. It doesn't mean you condone what happened. It doesn't mean you approve it. It just means you turn the key and walk out of the cell and walk into the sunlight of God's destiny for your life. And you no more live there. And so I want you to stretch your hand toward me and I want you to look at me. And I'm going to pray for you. And I want the rest of the congregation to stretch your hand toward them. Karen, I feel so strong about you walking over and getting right behind that young lady right there and praying for her. I want you to look right at me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the only begotten Son of the living God, who has put all of these things under his feet already. 
Jesus, you said about these situations, it is finished. That's the report you gave. It is finished. Y'all yeah, say it again, Lord. That's what you did. It is finished. Finished means over. Finished doesn't mean lasting results from. Finished doesn't mean something else to add to it. Finished means done. Finished. It's over. In Jesus' name. No wrong decision paralyzes you. Come on, get in agreement with me right now. No wrong decision paralyzes you. No abuse paralyzes you. No decisions of yesteryear stops you from tomorrow. No demonic attitude that would come against you. No reminders will paralyze you. Not from this day forward. We put our foot down in the name of Jesus. And we say no to it. If yeah. God is for us, nobody will be against us. And he didn't do half a work in you. Come on, I'm speaking prophetically. Receive it. He did not do half a work. He did a full work. And God has destiny for you. And you're going to walk into it. And you're going to walk into it like Caleb. And you're going to walk into it with no restrictions. And you're going to fulfill the call of God on your life. That's what's going to happen to you. Now I decree that. And I declare that in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to do one more thing here. Don't let this scare you. By the authority vested in me in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the only begotten Son of the living God, I take authority over every demonic voice every, every. that has been assigned to you to whisper in your ear. And by as I stand in my office as a man of God, I declare that you are arrested and you are restricted and you are incarcerated and you have no authority to speak into their memory anymore. Shut your mouth and leave them alone in the name of Jesus. Now shout like it's yours. Come on. Come on, all over this building. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I stand in my freedom today. Glory to God. And you know why it's that way? Because Jesus, <laughs> I just heard Kenneth say it. <laughs> I just heard Brother Copeland say it the way. Jesus is Lord. <laughs> I just heard him say it. Jesus is Lord. Come on, say it all over. Jesus is Lord. Say it again. Jesus is is Lord. Well, 